So I'm going to take us back to 2002, uh, where we'll be reacquainted with uh, uh, someone that you probably never never met in that particular name, uh, Ghislaine Raza. Um, you may know him, though, by his name that is known on the internet, uh, the Star Wars Kid. Uh, you probably see this video at some point. This was actually uploaded in 2003 without his permission. Um, what was really interesting about the time was he put this on a VHS tape for, for classmates at the time, uh, grabbed this, um, this video, put it online. At one point, uh, it was remixed in a number of different ways. There was a Terminator remix, there was a, uh, a, a number of the movies at the time, a Benny Hill remix. Uh, and it was really interesting seeing this thing grow. Uh, at one point, it was actually suggested that by 2006, there was about 900 million views of this video. Uh, Here's one of the most popular remixes at the time. Is like, was quite something. The, the problem that he faced, though, that he didn't, again, back to the idea that there was no permission. In fact, he was having a real tough time with this. He's being bullied about this. Imagine a video that you're incredibly embarrassed about being seen close to a billion times. Uh, so thinking about this particular video, it caused him all sorts of issues. Uh, there, again, a, a number of remixes. Uh, and what things that you perhaps didn't know about this case is in July 2003, the students finally filed uh, a lawsuit of about $250,000. Uh, there's some big issues issues around this, and obviously, um, and what you perhaps didn't know is that part of his eighth grade was spent actually under psychiatric care. He was that uh, hurt by this particular piece. Uh, McLean's magazine just recently actually uh, caught up with him. He's gone to McGill, he's a lawyer now, um, but what's interesting is he does provide some really good uh, advice. You know, he says to kids these days that through the cyberbullying episode that you'll survive, you'll get through it, and you're not alone. You're surrounded by people you love, and we hope that is the case for many, many students. So digital media has really contributed to once unimagined challenges for our uh, digital identities. It's the internet itself has shaped the way that we love, the way that we connect, the way that we mourn, uh, and it is really an amazing uh, a force in our lives. So what I'd like to do here is really talk about how the world has changed and what we can actually do about that. So I want to start off with, certainly at the very beginning, the speed and ubiquity of social media complicates our ability to control our digital footprint, directly implicating our identities. This is something that you know it has changed. It's not going to go back to the way it used to be. When I speak to middle year students as well as um, high school students, I talk very uh, discreetly about the idea of the digital artifact. So when we, when we upload something, whether it's a Vine video or a YouTube video uh, or anything that is digital, it can be easily copied, instantly shared, easily edited, and potentially viewable by millions. And, and that can be often when it's sort of some, you know, a cat video can be seen millions and millions of times, but at the same time, your most embarrassing moment can be seen millions of times. And where we used to come from a place where things were private by default and public of effort, and we think about our own lives and the privilege that we actually had, um, like before 2005, before you take t before YouTube came around, um, it was actually very, very difficult to um, upload video to the web. You had to use FTP servers, and it was just a huge hassle at that time. But things have changed, and we're now seeing this new generation public by default and private with effort. That kids actually have to untag themselves from Facebook posts. They have to ask their friends to take them down from particular spaces. And this is a really, really big change. Another big change is this idea of our digital lives are no longer separate entities, but instead have become <laughs> integral to who we are. And this actually, I'll point you to a theorist by the name of Nathan Jurgensen, and he actually talks about this idea that we're actually seeing the way that we view um, technology and life, we're seeing this digital dualism, that there's this difference between online versus offline spaces. He says, we live in an augmented reality, that it's not a different reality, it's an augmented reality that exists at the intersection of materiality and information, physicality and digitality, bodies and technology, atoms and bits, the off and the offline. It is wrong to say IRL to mean uh, offline. Facebook is real life. And you, you can understand those kids implicated by the things that are happening in their school, Facebook, Vine, Kick, those particular spaces are absolutely real life to these kids. 
And if we look at the digital footprint stats, these are rather alarming. 81% of kids by the age of two will have some sort of digital footprint uh, around them. 34% of, uh, of kids in Canada will have probably a sonogram or something shared about them. So digital footprint starts very, very young. Children reach the age of social media maturity by the age of 11. That means they've graduated from something like Club Penguin to like an Instagram account or a Facebook account, like an adult social network. And that is a huge change and there's new responsibilities for that. Um, Jason Older prompts us and he thinks about, and this is a really good question, should we teach our children as though they have one life or two, or two lives or one? And this is really an important idea because we often think about cyber safety as being some separate reality uh, of kid, that kids have to face when we know that this is much more serious. The complexities of identity pose a serious threat to the well-being of our youth. And we know many examples, and this is probably the, the saddest slide I've actually had to research in my life is looking at the number of kids who have been affected by cyberbullying who have decided to take their own lives. Every one of these kids in this photograph, and there's hundreds and hundreds of others who have been threatened or bullied because of some sort of digital artifact, a, a, a piece of their identity that has gone wild, that has come back to bite them, and they've had uh, so much tor uh, torment and stress around this that they, that they felt it was best to take their own lives. And this is something that we have to get better at. So what do we do about this? And I've got some ideas in terms of, you know, how can we actually be better at this and understanding this digital world and, of course, thinking about this with our kids. So first of all, I think there's actually a huge curriculum in memes. They're like those things that kid, we take for granted that kids are actually focused on. Think about the curriculum of memes. And I'll give you an example of something that has, was very popular a while ago. This is one particular uh, a selfie, all right? And, and this is, it seemed like a selfie like many other kids would, might have done. In this particular case, this Princess Brianna did this selfie in front of Auschwitz, which obviously there are some major issues with this in terms of whether it's appropriate or not in a space such as this. Of course, right away, people got on her and said, incredibly disrespectful, and, there was, and this was probably one of the politest ones that I've seen in terms of actually, you know, the responses that she got. Some people said, you know, this is the way the context is. This is, if you actually search, you, can, you see U.S. politicians doing the same thing in front of this particular space as well. Um, so some people supported her in some ways. She said that the, one of the reasons that this actually happened is that she had always studied this particular space, that she had always wanted to be here, that her father had passed away about a year ago and that she never got here. It's a different context. I don't know if it's true or not, but we have to think very carefully about context. So taking a story like this, bringing it into our classroom, because kids already know this particular story, you know, asking some key questions. How does one cope in a world where judgment of our action can be instantaneous, viral, and global, where it's something that we say online can just immediately shape our worlds in different ways. What's the importance of context and the judgment of others? How do we act appropriately? Or what is the how is the ubiquity of mobile technology reshaping the norms around communication and expression? How does it change the way we, you know, we actually express ourselves online? So there's so many questions, even from a single artifact, that we can talk about in terms of character education, but just in, you know, in education for our kids to be better equipped to actually handle what, what's coming for them. We also have to recognize that forgetting is no longer possible. And I think this is one of the key aspects here, is really an important idea that we have left the age of forgetting. In 1945, there was actually a, a group that put together the Teenage Bill of Rights. This is 1945 in the New York Times. The two, one of the two um, of the, the uh, rights that really struck me were the right to make mistakes, which I think obviously is a really important one. And remember, most of our mistakes, the people in this room, they're, they're gone. <laughs> they're, they're really gone. They're not on YouTube, Facebook, any of those particular spaces. We are privileged to be able to have that particular ability to erase our mistakes. And that idea that we can have the right to let our childhood be forgotten. Again, this is 1945. Then we see some sites like this. I mean, this is one of the most popular um, communication tools that, that students are using right now, Snapchat. To me, there's, there's a hidden gem in this. It's this idea of the right to ephemerality, that in this particular space, and the reason that it's marketed so well around this particular space is it gives students the hope that things can actually be forgotten, that the things that they actually, the things that they don't want to be on Facebook forever, they can do this because they live in this permanent digital, uh, contemporary time. 
And of course, there has been other legal uh, measures. You, you may have heard the um, e European Union's right to be forgotten. This is legislation that says, if you're a kid in the European Union somewhere at, at some point, and you've done something that's no longer happening in your life, and it's really uh, bringing you down in terms of your identity, that you can actually petition Google and have it removed from the search. And I think this is a really an interesting piece, but it's certainly not the whole story. This still is around the idea that we can erase part of our digital identity. Or we have to really think differently about this altogether. Um, there's a great um, article called The Web Means the End of Forgetting from Jeffrey Rosen. And he says, and I think this is really important to think about, as all of us stumble, stumble over the challenges of living in a world without forgetting, we need to learn new forms of empathy, new ways of defining ourselves without reference to what others say about us, and new ways uh, of forgiving one another for the digital trails that will hold us forever. We live again in this trip advisor society that anyone can basically say something about us, and it has incredible repercussions on our digital, uh, on our digital identity, but of course our livelihood as well. And third, the idea of modeling and cultivating positive online relationships is one of the most important pieces around this. Not only your online identity, but also online relationships, to model those for our students. And we see a wonderful examples, and I can guarantee that people in this room have done this with their students, and I think we need to see more of this. This is Kathy Cassidy's blog, a grade one teacher from, uh, from New Strauss, Saskatchewan, and she's done such a great job for years and years with her students, developing their student blogs, creating student voice, doing this in a very safe way that, of course, is in full, uh, in full face of all the parents who are supportive around this initiative. This particular example, this is a worksheet, this is a Twitter worksheet meant for grade one, where kids can write 140 characters. Now, 140 characters doesn't seem like a lot for us, but for a grade one, this is like an afternoon assignment, basically. <laughs> um, but what's, what's amazing about this is, kids are deliberate and intentional of what this goes. This doesn't automatically go to the web, but there's this buffering process that is, that is done by the teacher, and they get to think about, is this appropriate? Is this necessary? Is this nice? Is this something that we need to say? And what does it actually mean if we say something like we need this sort of thing, this sort of thinking in our classrooms. One of my students, a grad student this year, she does this really great exercise. She, she uses three comments and one question when kids are actually focused on um, commenting on the work of others. Commenting on the work of others is one of the most important things we can do in our classrooms. It's not simply writing ourselves, but how do we actually comment? What does discourse look? What does polite and critical discourse look in our lives? So she uses how do you compliment, how do you comment, how do you connect, and how do you question what people are saying in a very systematic way. It's a fantastic piece which really makes a lot of sense, and we can do these non-tech solutions in this really techie world. And I'm not going to show you this video, but if you get a chance, watch it. It's absolutely one of the most amazing things you'll see. Google um, uh, learn, uh, CNA Language Exchange. And what you see here is just a fantastic video where you'll actually see this group of um, this group of Brazilian language learners who are looking for people to talk to with. They've connected with these, this uh, senior's home in the U.S. And what's amazing about this is you see this great exchange, people bonding, people getting really, really close in this particular relationship. And this is one of those things, if we want really kids to cope in these particular spaces, we need to give them the spaces to experiment, to actually connect, for us to actually be able to guide them and see what online relationships are about. So if I look at this, I mean, in terms of some final thoughts, and really to kind of bring this home, I bring it to a story of my own personal, uh, uh, personal space, personal loss in my particular case. 693 days ago, I had lost my father, and it was one of the toughest times of my life, and, but I was really fortunate. I'm incredibly privileged and fortunate that I'm connected in the way that I am across the world in such interesting ways. So there's my dad. I mean, we we're very incredibly close, and of course, when you're mourning these days, things are a lot different. I mean, I posted that obligatory uh, post to Facebook. I talked about my dad, and instantly. Now, I wasn't, I wasn't there at that particular time waiting for you know, comments to come. I, obviously, my head was in a very different place, but then all of a sudden it exploded on my website, on, on Facebook. And seeing people from around the world just connect, just leave a little comment. Um, and I think what's amazing about this and later on, because I'm really a big geek and I just tend to like do stuff like this, I decided to like globally map this. I mean, this was months and months later, but I wanted to get a chance to see where people are actually connected. I was amazed, like in my, in my saddest dreams about you know, being a child, thinking about something like this happening, I never thought that the morning of my father would be such a global thing, that I'd be so incredibly connected. 
We are in a privileged society that has the ability to connect in this particular way. And I think we, we owe it to our kids to help bring them to this particular space, to see the affordances of these new technologies, but of course, not compromising their identity, to do this in safe spaces that are good for our kids. Clay Shirky, some time ago, uh, actually, I'll, I'll talk about this, the photograph first. This is a photograph of my dad and my three kids. We FaceTime a lot. And this is one of those photographs that really connects me with the most humanizing aspects of technology, just simply connecting online. And because my dad lived, my parents lived about three hours away, we couldn't connect face to face all the time. And there's something to be said about that. Clay Shirky said, around this idea, we systematically overestimate the value of access to information and underestimate the value of access to each other. And I think this is so important. Again, if we are going to go ahead, we have to think about this. So how do we help our kids? And this is the last question I'll leave with you. Discover and experience the many emerging possibilities for network human connection while allowing them to safely grow and shape their identities and the identities of others. And this is the question I leave you with, and I hope we can share some of the amazing aspects of our world with our kids, but let's do it in, in a way that we can make sure that they're safe and responsible and that they don't jeopardize the rest of their futures. Thank you.